Well, several places in India are likely to suffer from humid heat waves in the next few days. This April, India has experienced unusual high temperatures with heat waves hitting various parts of the country as reported by the IMD. This heat is not like the heat we have seen before. We know very clearly that the heat, the extreme heat that we see now is first of all changing very rapidly. It gives us very less time to adapt even physiologically to it. Heat waves are coming of course much more frequently than earlier. They're coming earlier in the year as you said. May and April uh, being extremely hot months now in the year, even in places like Bangalore. So when the nature of heat is changing, to expect that these centuries old practices are going to somehow magically deal with that heat is unfair. You're listening to State of South Asia, a podcast from Himal South Asian, where we speak to some of the best minds on the region to unpack crucial issues affecting our politics, cultures, environments, and societies. I'm your host, Nantara. South Asia is right now in the middle of what many climate scientists are calling a historic heat wave. We understand viscerally what a heat wave is, that it is extremely hot, hotter than we are used to in a certain place at a certain time. But here's the technical definition of a heat wave according to the World Meteorological Organization. A heat wave can be defined as a period where local excess heat accumulates over a sequence of unusually hot days and nights. The WMO also says that heat waves amplify many risks, such as heat related or economic risks, including increased human mortality, drought and water quality, wildfire and smoke, power shortages, and agricultural losses. As we record this episode on the 3rd of May, Let's take a look at recent impacts of heat in the South Asian neighborhood. A town in central Myanmar hit a record 48.2 degrees Celsius on the 29th of April, the highest temperature recorded anywhere in the country since record keeping began more than 50 years ago. April temperatures have been three to four degrees higher than the average in many parts of the country. High temperatures in Bangladesh have resulted in school closures affecting about 32 million students. Temperatures in the capital, Dhaka, have been hovering at an unrelenting 40 degrees Celsius. India has entered a third week of heatwave-like conditions, according to its meteorological department. The highest maximum temperature recorded has been 47.2 degrees Celsius in Gangetic, West Bengal. And the country as a whole has had 14% less rain than is usual for the season. There have been at least four heat-related deaths reported, two in Kerala and two in Orissa. Sri Lanka had issued heat alerts in mid-April as temperatures in some parts crossed 39 degrees Celsius. Nepal has been battling wildfires in the middle of this heat wave. The country has had about 4,500 wildfires this year, which is approximately double the usual number. Meanwhile, Pakistan and Afghanistan are experiencing unseasonal heavy rain that has killed more than 130 people. The weather historian Maximiliano Herrera has said in a social media post that thousands of records are being brutalized all over Asia and that this is by far the most extreme event in world climactic history. To discuss this extreme weather in South Asia, its causes and effects, and what we might do about it, we have with us Chani Singh, an environmental social scientist at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore. Chandni studies the linkages between climate change and development with a focus on changing livelihoods in rural and urban places. She is also a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report. Chandni, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So Chani, we had a spot of rain last evening. It was a thunder shower, actually, and it was very, very welcome because we had no rain in April. And I read a newspaper article that said that this was the first April since 1983, where we had, we've had no rain, which means that as a resident of Bangalore, for most of my life, since the year I was born, it has always rained in April, except for this year. So that was a pretty shocking statistic to me. You, you are also based in Bangalore. How have you experienced uh, these very high temperatures at the start of summer instead of, you know, temperatures gradually progressing and it getting hotter towards 
the middle or, and the peak of summer and just before the monsoons in June. Absolutely. I think this year has been particularly difficult in Bangalore. I've been living here in the city now for 10 years and I don't remember such a hot summer. I've also grown up in Delhi and I feel that I'm used to and recognize what heat looks like. But I think Bangalore has always been in this range of having a, a weather that's very comfortable for people and especially March and April being not as hot as they've been this year. But while there's a lot of focus on Bangalore, I think the rest of Karnataka, the state where Bangalore is in, has been facing really extreme heat. And I was just looking at the IMD, the Indian Meteorological Department uh, forecasts for the next week, and they're touching, uh, say, 46 degrees in North Karnataka. So there's a lot of focus on cities when we talk about heat, but also rural areas are facing even more extreme uh, conditions. Right. So looking beyond Karnataka at the rest of India, some parts are experiencing temperatures in the high 40s. The IMD has forecast a rise of between 4 to 6 degrees Celsius in many parts of North India in the coming weeks. So it doesn't really look that there's going to be any respite anytime soon, right? Absolutely. So the IMD, of course, does these uh, short term and then slightly more longer term seasonal forecasts. And as you rightly said, these these are really disturbing numbers. Because of these kind of reports from the IMD, actually, there's been a big push to change school hours, make sure people aren't working outdoors, providing a lot of, you know, water and just basic uh, relief from heat. So I think there is the story of increasing heat. What is more disturbing to me is, I mean, I know that the numbers that we see from the IMD tend to catch everyone's attention, but also lots of coastal areas. For example, you, you mentioned West Bengal in your introduction. Also, Odisha are facing extremely high temperatures. They are seeing, I mean, heat waves have been announced. And uh, they've also got the issue of humidity. Similarly, in Kerala, which is a state that does see humidity and also gets hot at this time, but not as hot as we are seeing this year. So this intersection of humidity and extreme temperatures, which I think in recent years has got a lot of attention. But what we don't understand is how quickly that can sort of tip into a very dangerous situation where there's extreme heat stress or even mortality in some cases. Right. Take us a little bit through the science of why a heat wave occurs and the possible combination of factors that uh, really make a heat wave. That's, there's no easy answer to that. There are various factors that shape uh, extreme heat. Of course, where South Asia lies is also a tropical area. So historically, just because of where the this region is, there is extreme heat. And as we move into the summer, which is typically May, June, uh, maybe sometimes a bit of July, you do see periods of high heat. This year, of course, what has happened is last year we had something, this phenomenon called the El Nino, which started around March, April of uh, 2023. And the El Nino, of course, there are scientists are uh, divided on whether this has really shaped the extreme heat we are seeing. But we know that El Nino events also uh, modulate the both heat and the precipitation, so rainfall. And that has also caused this drying and heating up that we're seeing this year. The El Nino now is in a decline, but of course, the repercussions of that are still being seen. Apart from this, of course, you cannot avoid the reality of anthropogenic climate change, so human-induced global warming. Uh, the fact that we are emitting more and more greenhouse gas uh, gases, which actually trap heat. So it's a mix of these kinds of the El Nino of a uh, phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean, climate change, which is very much human induced. And then, of course, the way we are developing and the way we are human beings have really changed the landscapes we are living in. So we are seeing decreasing green cover. We're seeing reducing water bodies, both green cover and blue spaces or water bodies really reduce heat. And of course, finally, then the way we are building. So our cities, the materials that we use in cities uh, in particular, they lead to something called the urban heat island, which really traps heat in particular places that pick because of their urban morphology. So how dense they are and how high they go, they trap heat, they restrict air circulation. And of course, they also build over green spaces, which then lead to, you know, this concentration of heat. So all these things coming together, and of course, different places are going to have different combinations of these things leading to this, this experience of heat. And there's also the social phenomenon of how people experience heat waves, right? 
the way that people live in cities and move through them, or the way they do their jobs and access public spaces, all this, you know, which really is a person's social context, can influence their experience of heat as well? Absolutely. So I think a lot of, and I'm glad that you asked this question, because a lot of people tend to focus on these temperatures and numbers to sort of give this very uh, disturbing story of heat. But the experience of heat is very, is often not only just those temperatures, but also, as you rightly said, where you live in the city, what you do, your access to having some space that is cool, your ability to cool yourself, especially in the night. So from the research and as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC really talks about risk as composed of multiple things. So one part of risk is the hazard. So how hot is it, which is what we've been talking about. The second part is exposure, which is how exposed are you? And usually based on your job, whether you're an outdoor street vendor, for example, you are, of course, going to be much more exposed when there's a heat wave compared to someone who might be sitting in an air conditioned office inside. And then finally, the part that we don't talk about as much as the other two is vulnerability. So based on your age, your gender, your uh, livelihoods, the kinds of comorbidities you already have, whether you have access to a space that's cool, all of that shapes your vulnerability. And what we've seen, my own research, but also globally, actually, we've seen that these personal risk factors, so, you know, your demographic situation and your occupational risk factors really shape that social vulnerability to heat. Unfortunately, in a country like India, but also across a lot of South Asia, most of our economy is informal. So a lot of people, at least in India, I think the numbers are 80 to 85% of our economy is informal. So what that means is you don't have insurance, health insurance. You don't have access often to cool spaces, clean water. You can't take leave and get paid leave. So all of that also then shapes how you really interact with these extreme temperatures and heat waves and then how you can recuperate and recover from them. So it's, it's much more complex than the common narrative around, oh, this record has been uh, broken here and these are the number of schools that are closed. Underlying all of that are these very entrenched stories of inequality, I guess, within our societies and then within both our rural and urban areas. You said how people in the informal economy are more vulnerable to heat stress. Can you give us some examples of specific groups and of how vulnerable they are? Yeah, so I mean, we we know very clearly that outdoor workers do experience heat at a much more significant level. They are often working uh, with very little access to shade, for example, street vendors, but also construction workers. And these sites, even the sites of work are often extremely hot. Anecdotally, across India, and I know this from Bangladesh and Nepal as well, there is increasingly researchers are finding that people are facing all kinds of health impacts. So you've got increased incidence of dengue and malaria because, for example, construction sites often pool water, you know, just uh, the nature of these work sites. And then these lead to these vector-borne diseases higher incidence of them. You've got uh, people actually losing concentration while working in certain industries, again, construction, painting, tiling, that kind of work. And you've got also difficulties in, I mean, again, anecdotally, but I think this is also an area of increasing research, mental health impacts, things like in increased stress, feelings of not being able to rest enough. So those kinds of things also come up. A lot of people talk about outdoor workers, which is understandably the most visible form of work that gets affected by heat. But there's also a story of indoor work and a lot of studies are now increasingly showing that often women are the ones who are doing care work within homes that are extremely hot, especially poor women, women living in informal settlements where you may be living in a very small one room tenement, which has say a tin roof or an asbestos roof, which is really like place that traps heat. And then, of course, you've got care duties upon that. So there is a story of indoor workers and people staying indoors who are also experiencing heat, which is not often spoken about. The final thing I just want to say is that while we tend to focus a lot on heat, all the recent research actually says that hazards don't come individually. So there is a compounding of hazards. Things happen simultaneously and people experience these simultaneously. Now, again, 
in Bangalore, I'm sure you know about it also, Bangalore's also been facing extreme water scarcity. And heat and water scarcity are two hazards that are very, very closely coupled. In Uttarakhand and Nepal, of course, there are these devastating forest fires going on. Again, extreme temperature and forest fires are linked. And this really is the challenge. We can sort of maybe cool down to extreme heat in some ways. But then what do we do when there's heat and water scarcity? Because some of the advisories are around drinking more water and keeping cool. Uh, using water during heat waves. So it's this compounding of hazards which lead to very different levels of risk, which often people don't appreciate and therefore then don't, you know, prepare for such extreme risk. Talking about how we've been building our cities, there has been some discussion that we have been emulating models from other parts of the world and not really investing in architecture that's more suited to our climates. Uh, some of these might be traditional architecture. Do you think that this is true? And how much of a problem is that? Yes, it is a problem. I think countries like India are urbanizing and are also at a certain stage in their development trajectory, which requires the building of a lot of new infrastructure. Or Now, in some ways, that is, of course, inevitable. You need to ensure people have housing. You need to ensure there are roads and bridges to carry goods and people. And so I understand this push towards more infrastructure. The challenge is really exactly what you said, what happens when we build this infrastructure on ecosystems, on certain other infrastructures that are not valued the same way we value, say, buildings and flyovers and so on. And that is what a lot of Western countries are now sort of trying to retrofit their cities that are already very dense and built up to think about how do you bring in nature-based solutions, greening cities, preserving water and so. The challenge in India, I think many cities are actually now moving towards that kind of thinking. There is a lot of interest both at the national state and then of course city government level to experiment with some of these solutions. But what the challenge is, all of this requires money. And then where do you invest in? How do you ensure that you are building housing stock, but also preserving your lakes and rivers? And these are not easy trade-offs to make decisions around. So I do agree that, of course, there is a push towards thinking about more sustainable, green, maybe heat and climate resilient cities. But there are not so many models that you can really build this kind of work on. So the other thing is that many places across South Asia have a deep memory of heat. We have a social sort of collective understanding of heat. Growing up in North India, I have experienced us drinking cooling drinks, making sure that, you know, so there are some behavioral things that are ingrained in our society around heat. And I think those are useful. Of course, similarly, like we have social behaviors around managing heat, we also in our architecture, in our built form, we see that there's a lot of vernacular architecture around building around heat, making sure that we're using certain kinds of materials planting trees near temples and things like that. So there is a culture around that. But what I always like to highlight is this heat is not like the heat we have seen before. We know very clearly that the heat, the extreme heat that we see now is first of all changing very rapidly. It gives us very less time to adapt even physiologically to it. Heat waves are coming, of course, much more frequently than earlier. They're coming earlier in the year, as you said, like May and April uh, being extremely hot uh, months now in the year, even in places like Bangalore. So when the nature of heat is changing, to expect that these centuries old practices are going to somehow magically deal with that heat is unfair. And so I feel that there has to be a mix of understanding that this we're really in a new risk regime, and this is anthropogenic. So thinking of that, I'm not dismissing uh, vernacular architecture, but we need to, of course, build on that and then sort of modify it for this extreme heat. So that brings me to a question about building understanding. And then that really is about research. You said that there are not too many models of sustainable buildings of cities to work with. If we had invested in research and building for the region, earlier, would we have been in a better position now? Or is it good enough that we are doing it at this point of time to build that understanding? Where are we in terms of research? I'm not an architect myself, but um, I know very clearly that architecture schools in the country actually do a very poor job of teaching climate change 
in their syllabus, there is a very reduced understanding of how the built form has to intersect with this changing nature of yeah the weather, but also climate variability and climate change. There are some experiments, of course, there's a lot of work around what kinds of materials to use, how to improve, say, passive ventilation in buildings so that you're not only thinking about air conditioning and active cooling, which is also very energy in uh, intensive as the only way to do it. So in terms of do we have the tools and techniques to build heat resilient buildings? Yes, we do. And we have in the past, as you also said. The problem is that that's not mainstream. And the reason that's not mainstream is we have lost the skills and the incentives to really build like that just aren't there. It's easier, faster and cheaper to build with say glass facades and bricks rather than building with mud and rammed earth blocks. So those are the kinds of issues which I think dissuade builders to actually build with some of these materials. Let's talk about adaptation. Several cities in India have climate adaptation plans. I believe Ahmedabad has been one that has had an adaptation plan for many years. And other cities in India are making similar such plans. What is the status of adaptation to heat specifically in cities across the region? So India does have a significant policy focus on adapting to heat. Just for those who don't understand it, adaptation is basically either preparing for or responding to risks in a manner that will reduce risk in the future. So it's, it's a very iterative process of sort of building your capacities to reduce risk to a hazard. Now, there have been several policy interventions at the national level. Of course, we have the meteorological department that sends out advisories. That's a form of an adaptation strategy where you're giving people and, of course, various government, subnational governments, enough information about what the hazard is going to look like in the next few weeks, next few days, and then the expectation that you're going to ensure there are some relief measures in place. So we have a range of things like cooling stations, you have uh, water pots being kept out, a lot of awareness building around staying indoors or staying in shaded areas, drinking water, ORS being uh, distributed and all of that. So those are a set of relief measures that kick in once there is some kind of heat wave announced. Uh, you also, of course, have preparatory measures. And uh, those tend to be focused on ensuring that there's enough water, for example, ensuring that we have these forecasts being you know, sent out to the right departments, including the health department and so on. And capacity building for, say, ASHA workers, nurses really at, you know, primary health centers. So really trying to create a cadre of people who understand the risk and then know what to do with it once there is maybe heat stress in people. So the way that heat adaptation plans in the country work, various states have heat action plans and then, of course, cities do have them. Ahmedabad in 2012, after the 2010 devastating heat wave where they had uh, a lot of deaths, actually developed the first heat action plan of South Asia. That has really been an exemplar and now has been replicated across the country, but also across the region in many uh, places beyond India. Uh, recently, we actually completed a study assessing heat action plans for 10 cities across the country. And... In some ways, they do very well because they have a plan. They, they have very clear directives or standard operating procedures for different departments in a city. What do you really do when there's a heat wave? What do you do right after it? What do you do before it? And so I would really like to applaud that there's at least so much policy attention on heat action plans. However, in our analysis, what we also saw is that many of these are very incremental and short term in nature. What I mean by that is an incremental adaptation is really this idea that you are changing and tinkering things in the system. So you do have your cooling points and your water pots being put out, but that's just insufficient to deal with the kind of uh, hazard you're seeing. So there is a lot of incremental action. Some uh, cities like Bhubaneswar and Ahmedabad, also to some extent Surat, are moving towards a more transformational approach to dealing and adapting to heat. So you're really trying to change the entire system. People are being trained at all levels of government. You have a lot of interagency coordination. And there's a move to really change the system, making sure that there are spaces in the city that are allocated for tree planting and you know keeping green cover and things like that. But some cities and states are still in that 
tinkering stage and they've not moved to more transformational adaptation. Apart from this, what is more glaring to me is there are several cities that are facing extreme heat but do not have any kind of heat action plans. And while I've heard this number of, I think, 150 heat action plans across the country, I have yet to see those heat action plans. They're difficult to track down. And so I wonder what those are. Many of them are in the form of, say, PPTs and not really even like well fleshed out plans. And it remains to be seen who is really going to implement the plan? Where's the money to finance these plans going to come from? So there's a lot more work. There's a good start and there's a lot of precedence, say, from Ahmedabad and now increasingly Bhubaneswar. And it remains to be seen where they go. The other thing that various states also now have are these state action plans on health and climate change, where they look at heat, but also other kinds of uh, diseases and things like that, like vector-borne diseases. And that's another space because it sits so squarely in the health uh, department that there can be some strides made. Again, there are questions, of course, of are there capacities within the governance system to actually implement them? And then where does the money come from? So that's where we are actually in the space of yeah, heat governance and heat adaptation. What about beyond India? Do we have a sense of what heat adaptation looks like in the rest of South Asia? Because I would imagine that a heat action plan for Ahmedabad would look very different for, from a heat action plan for Kathmandu or Dhaka or you know, a city in Pakistan or Afghanistan. How are places beyond India but within South Asia also adapting to extreme heat? Of course, there are some cities, again, that have heat action plans. Dhaka, for example, has a heat uh, officer, one part of Dhaka, actually. So there are initial steps. I do think that India has been a front runner because of the, the Ahmedabad model that started off yeah, in the early uh, 2010s. As you rightly say, of course, heat action plans have to be localized. You have to have localized heat thresholds, actually, because 35 degrees might mean uh, extreme heat stress in some populations, and it might not mean that in a city like Ahmedabad, which regularly sees 42 and 45 degrees Celsius. So the idea that what is the heat threshold or the temperature threshold at which you tip into heat morbidity, heat stress, heat mortality, heat deaths, is what needs to be done. The challenge there is, and this is not only for other South Asian areas, but also some parts in India, is that we don't have the scientific expertise in every state and every place to develop these. There's The story of heat thresholds has been driven by research in temperate countries and uh, populations that are not always South Asian. And so we did this, this focus on putting in money and research attention into building localized thresholds is something that is happening, but that really then has to inform these heat action plans. And then, of course, places um, in the Himalayas, so cities like Kathmandu, but also across the Indian Himalayas, uh, need to be thinking of very different, both how the hazard is, the kinds of cascading impacts of the hazard, and then also the solutions that are proposed. I know from, again, uh, speaking to researchers in uh, Kathmandu that dengue incidence has exponentially grown in Kathmandu, which can be linked to some of this increasing heat that one is seeing. Focusing on those kinds of impacts is what will become very important in those kinds of cities. What happens when there is an absence or a minimal presence of a well-functioning government, and you started the episode with the story of Myanmar. And that too is quite a story because, again, I uh, know of friends who have been living there in the country and talking about 12 to 18 hour power cuts. And so what happens in such situations? How do you really even think about heat action planning when there's not a functional government. So there are those kinds of issues where conflict and climate change, I think, intersect, which again, we don't know very well. What do you, what governance structures work in that kind of system? How do you really think about it? Is there a model for a heat action plan in a non-urban area? So for instance, you know, extreme heat in a rural area of India, where a lot of people are engaged in agriculture and they can't really afford to sit at home or in the shade. Uh, all the time. Is there a model for a heat action plan for an area like that? So some of the Indian state heat action plans actually cover both rural and urban areas. There are big sections. If you look at some of them, there are big sections on how to uh, protect 
say, agricultural laborers, people working outdoors in rural areas, especially because March and April in some parts of the country are peak harvest seasons. So wheat, for example, has to be cut and it has to be cut when it's warm enough because the, the grain has to be dry enough. I mean, so there is a focus on understanding and assessing what impacts there are on such populations and the heat action plans do cover rural areas. One of the most common things that are suggested is, of course, shifting work hours, so working uh, earlier in the morning. And people intuitively also do that. I mean, in my own research, I've seen that people do shift their hours. So instead of starting, uh, say, at 6 a.m., they'll start at 4 a.m. But you can understand, again, the gendered and unequal burdens that that kind of shifting puts on certain people in a household and how far at what stage do you stop shifting that it's reducing the number of hours you can work and it's not only shifting hours is again to me a band-aid solution of course you can do that but some people can't afford to shift their hours some people might even though they've moved uh, their work hours they are still feeling the impacts of heat even if you're working till nine or ten in the morning it does get pretty hot so there are those issues around how effective some of these strategies are and that really is another area which there's very little research on so in urban areas there have been experiments about how much green cover do you need to reduce temperatures by xyz but in rural areas what are the strategies that are really truly effective that that research I mean, has been done, but it's very piecemeal. Uh, Chandi, I'm going to ask you now to switch hats from the climate and environmental researcher to that of a person reading the news in this election season in India. So we're in the middle of a very long election taking place over a month and a half. And it's been very eventful in terms of the politics and the scandals and the happenings on campaign trails. But everyone is experiencing this very hot summer and yet extreme heat, the environment, or climate change, none of these have been significant topics in election discussions. How do you see that as someone who, on the one hand, is studying these subjects, and on the other hand, is not really seeing it in the big news of the day? Absolutely. So I think just thinking about the news as a layperson, my signal that something is going right with environmental reporting is that I no longer need to explain what I do to my non-climate change friends and family. So the public discourse on climate change, at least the basics, that there's something changing, it's anthropogenic in nature, and this is what it looks like, extreme heat waves, increasing drought, and all of that associated with it. So I think the public perception on climate change has definitely moved. And I think the media has had a big role to play. Unfortunately, of course, our political parties have been, unfortunately, but also and unsurprisingly, they have been slow to catch up with this. Nationally, of course, and internationally rather, India has India's stance on climate change has been very clear and I think understandably focused on the fact that there are certain countries that have polluted, that have caused the situation we are in. And you have to allow the space for a country like India, large, populous, also relatively poor country to develop. And so that I understand. What I find unfortunate is that we have not been able to have a robust political, a domestic conversation that is linked to big parties in the country around climate change and climate action. Uh, there are some snippets and lots of people have done these analyses of how climate change has been mentioned in political manifestos. And uh, when I read the manifestos of all the major parties, it's, it's extremely sad to see that given the kind of climate research we have, there is a lack of imagination on what we can do about climate change. And it remains very sectoral in nature. Climate change is often reduced to the environment, which is let's plant more trees. Uh, but that's a completely inadequate response to the kind of risk we are seeing. So it's, to me, it's deeply disturbing. And perhaps there's been a lot of research actually around this about how do you get climate change into political conversations? And perhaps it has to be demand driven that voters have to start demanding better environmental services, better uh, conditions and, you know, around how we work, where we live and all of that. And it's difficult, but I feel that the public narrative and public understanding around climate change is changing. And that is what will drive political change rather than hoping for the politics to show us the way really.
Right. So on that note, here's a quick reminder for our listeners that we have more on the heat wave and the election on the Himal South Asian website. Read our contributor Aradhana Wal's piece on how soaring temperatures find little mention in mainstream media. Himal's in-depth independent coverage of the whole of South Asia relies on the support of listeners like you. To support our work and to help us produce more podcasts like this one, you can become a patron of the magazine by clicking on the link in the episode notes or by going to our website, himalmag.com and clicking support Himal. You can also sign up to our newsletters to keep up with our latest stories, podcasts, events, and more. You'll see a sign up link to our newsletters also in the episode notes. Now back to our conversation with Chandni Singh. Chandni, we've talked a lot about extreme heat. I'd like to broaden the lens to talk about the larger issue of climate change in South Asia. And one of the most sensitive areas really is the Himalayas. We've already seen many de devastating effects of climate change in the Himalayas, and there continue to be many large risks. For example, a new study indicates that there are a large number of new glacier lakes forming from the melting of glaciers, which carry the risk of causing extreme flooding if they breach their boundaries. What is your major worry for the Himalayan region right now? So I started my career in the Himalayas. And so that's a region also very close to me. And even then, 15 years ago, there were early signs of, you know, the fingerprints of climate change starting to change things. Uh, so people seeing untimely snowfall, apple crops getting destroyed because of unseasonal rain and snow. And of course, then drying of uh, natural springs across the Himalayas, which are very important for water security. And a sort of, uh, because of all of this, impacts on, of course, people's livelihoods and incomes. And that has just exacerbated, intensified over the recent decade. And we show very clearly, I was a lead author in the IPCC where I was actually focusing on Asia. And within Asia, we see that, of course, the Himalayas are sort of the canary in the coal mine. They are also uh, climate hotspots which are seeing, of course, changes in snowfall, changes, therefore, in uh, snow melt, and then the kind of water that you see in, uh, in rivers that originate in the Himalayas. And then, as you said, these glacial lake outburst floods or gloffs, which, um, which are another thing that, I mean, there have been several mapping initi initiatives to show that they are increasing and the potential or the risk of flooding is uh, increasing as well. So I think the Himalayas in some ways both see a lot of environmental change, so shifts in land use and land cover, greening and so on, but also see are uh, seeing this change in, uh, yeah, in snow and precipitation and temperature. I know in this conversation we've not spoken about it a lot and we've spoken a lot about human beings and impacts and how human systems are uh, dealing with heat or other extremes, but in the Himalayas also, we're seeing a lot of evidence about species migration, so non-human species, both animal and plants. You're seeing uh, crop cycles change. You are also then seeing, because of a combination of uh, decreased green cover, a lot of human wildlife conflict where wildlife corridors are reducing, their habitats are being destroyed, and then they're coming into croplands. And then, of course, that creates real devastation for agriculture-based livelihoods. All of this together is then shaping what I actually work on, which is out-migration. And you see there's a phenomenon of ghost villages, say, in Uttarakhand. And you see wide out-migration from the Himalayan regions uh, into very precarious livelihoods in cities like, say, Bangalore and Delhi and so on. So it's really an unraveling of a social ecological system, which has a very clear, I mean, the roots of it, of course, are in climate and environmental change, but the repercussions are far beyond that. What, according to you, are the other kind of climate hotspots, areas that are vulner most vulnerable to climate change across South Asia? So across South Asia, there's very clear evidence that particular areas, so low-lying deltas and dense cities within them are climate hotspots just because of, of course, their geographical location. So places like Calcutta, Dhaka, and the fact that they're exposed to sea level rise, flooding, and then 
changes in cyclonic patterns. There are other coastal areas also that have not been traditionally witnessing or experiencing cyclones, like in the west coast of India, that are also now projected to see uh, cyclones of increasing intensity. And that's really worrying because in climate hotspots or places that have been hotspots of extreme events, there's still, again, a memory and a culture of preparedness around some of these events. But when they come to areas that have actually no experience of dealing with cyclones, the devastation is much higher. So one is, of course, these deltaic cities as well as coastal cities. The second, of course, we spoke about high altitude areas, the Himalayas, and uh, they are seeing, of course, rapid change. And then finally, places we don't talk a lot about are inland, rain-fed, semi-arid regions. There's, apart from climate change, there's a big story of land use change and desertification, where semi-arid areas across India are actually moving towards becoming more and more desiccated and arid areas. And what that does to, again, rain-fed farming, farm livelihoods, abilities to rear livestock in some of these regions is another story that I think doesn't get as much attention as some of these more iconic or more visible uh, climate hotspots. So there's a vast range from central to south India, which is extremely semi-arid and is seeing increasing aridity and high temperatures as well, which also I would call a climate hotspot. The other thing to say is that climate hotspots, many people often talk about it again in terms of the hazard. So there is extreme rain or extreme heat, and that becomes a climate hotspot. But the way I talk about climate hotspots is, again, it's the intersection of a hazard with underlying vulnerabilities based on caste and livelihoods and so on. So you can't look at climate hotspots as only spaces that are seeing extreme events, but they're also places that hold a lot of history based on maybe their histories of colonization or their histories of how livelihoods are shaped out there. And that's also what makes the experience of climate change and extreme weather very different in South Asia than from the rest of the world, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And the 2022 IPCC report for the first time was able to at least put the word colonization as a driver of some of these extreme changes that we are seeing. And the fact that these changes are extremely um, unequal. The inequality in the story of climate change is much more visible in terms of or much more spoken about in terms of who emitted historically and who didn't. But I think the what is particularly uh, understudied, but many people understand it viscerally, is that the capacities to deal with climate change are very different based on which country you are born into, what colonial history those countries have. There was a study, I think, in 2022 that showed that extreme heat depresses GDP of low-income tropical countries by around 67 to 7% and depresses the GDP of uh, developed countries by around 1.7%. So you are seeing such a high level of unequal impact on certain countries and it is not just by accident there there are histories that we have to sort of recognize sure you know there are also these different levels at which we interact with the idea of climate change and so and one is you know we talked about the heat action plans and that i would kind of put at a mid level where your local authority local government uh, does something for the you know the population within its uh, control. But, you know, below that, I guess it's at the individual level. And then above that, I would put like what's happening at the international level and like, negotiations like the uh, conference of parties on climate change. Let's just talk about individual level for a moment. Most times it's very difficult to think about what individuals can do about extreme weather, uh, apart from just experiencing it and trying to stay safe. Let's take the example of extreme heat. Uh, what do you do to protect yourself and your family but what can you also do in terms of contributing to the conversation or changing it in a way that you want to? Absolutely. I think all of us deal with this dissonance of one, we have to, uh, because of the places that we live in, we are experiencing things like extreme heat and we have to deal with that. And there are a range of things you can do, keeping cool, eating certain kinds of foods, drinking a lot of fluids staying indoors if you have the ability to do so. Of course, if you have a artificially cooled place, then that is, of course, even better. Lots of non-governmental organizations, 
civil society organizations in India are experimenting with a range of solutions in low income settlements like painting roofs white and giving very targeted advisories. So if you are, there can be things that you do at an individual level, which is changing your own behavior when you are in the middle of a heat wave or during extreme heat. But apart from that, I think all of us do understand that we hold certain power in certain ways and we can contribute to the conversation. So, of course, researchers do it in one way, the media does it in another way. But there's a big space for what I believe is space for building a public conversation around climate literacy. So just making ourselves aware about it, the ability to talk about climate change intelligently to other people who aren't thinking about making the links between extreme temperature here and anthropogenic climate change. And this is where I think education plays a big role, a big role to sort of amplify the conversation. I think youngsters, and I do a lot of talks with school kids, and they sort of seem to be much more aware about some of these things. So really, perhaps using some of the tactics that the private sector use around advertising to children to influence the parents, that's what I think we need to think about, that when there is a a group of people, especially young children, who are so tuned to these conversations, using their awareness and interest really as a vehicle to pass the message around. Apart from that, I think sometimes the conversation on climate change can become very disempowering and it just seems like so big a problem that you can't do anything about it. Many people have spoken about there being steps to it. So first of all, educating oneself, making oneself literate, and then seeing in what ways you can do things. Some people teach, some people talk about it. Some people actually go and build cooling centers. So there are different ways that one can really think about it based on who you are, really. So that brings us to the international question. We have had slow progress on COP negotiations, and these invariably stall over questions of finance, where developing countries are not willing to pay for adaptation or technology in developing countries, which have actually contributed less to emissions and many of which are former colonies. From a South Asian perspective, what should we expect from such international negotiations? Fortunately, unfortunately, these negotiations are the only structure that we have to really bring uh, various countries together. And we know, I mean, there's, the conversation is moving forward, but it's often moving too slowly. Now, of course, just uh, recently, I think a day or two ago, the conversations in uh, Dubai just finished on loss and damage, which is basically thinking about or discussing mechanisms to transfer money for losses due to climate events, climate related events, and then also paying for damages. And we know one of the big challenges, of course, I guess the knowledge gaps is we have estimates, of course, of how much it's going to cost. And there are levels of uncertainty with that. But the bigger challenge is there are value systems that all the countries are not able to agree upon. So the idea of there being a space to develop and adapt. Of course, it's it's enshrined in the 2015 Paris Agreement, but the mechanisms of that are still something, I think. So there's a more fundamental divergence in values and that then plays out in the form of oh we won't give you money or if we give you money it's in the form of loans and not grants and which further you know puts countries in South Asia and other parts also in cycles of debt so I of course don't have any answers to all these very complex issues but what does give me hope is that while these conversations are going on at an international intergovernmental scale there are other actors that have taken charge. So there's a lot of push towards the private sector now bringing in money. Again, I'm always skeptical of how that's going to play out. But, and of course, they come with their own incentive structures, which often may not work for uh, contexts. But that's one space that is evolving. And perhaps as researchers and people who are watching this space, we really need to, again, see what does that work for South Asian uh, countries, really, for our populations. The second space, of course, is civil society actors that are really sort of experimenting both in terms of technologies, but also in terms of how do you really get this right on the ground? And I feel there are lots of interesting experiments across South Asia. There's a lot to learn from South Asia around extreme heat, just because of this social memory around uh, extreme heat. Also a lot of work in Thailand, Singapore, so Southeast Asia also, where they are really experimenting with how do you deal with humid heat. 
So there are solutions. They are very bottom up. They're somehow spread out. They are definitely insufficient for the kind of heat we are seeing. I don't want to somehow suggest that we are doing enough. These bottom up solutions are happening despite the failure of negotiations, not because of them. And so the negotiations do have to still continue. And uh, hopefully the next COP moves the conversation forward a bit. Right. So right now, in the middle of this heat wave, it's difficult to imagine other kinds of extreme weather. But in just a couple of months, the monsoon is going to hit the subcontinent. I just read a new story based on our study, uh, which shows that the interaction of Western disturbances with the monsoon has the potential to cause an increased risk of flooding in many parts. In South Asia, it often feels like we're jumping from one climate crisis to another. So how really, how do countries plan for the long term when it comes to extreme weather? That's the million dollar question because this is exactly what climate modelers had been talking about and predicting, which is that you're not just going to see a heat wave here and then a few years later flood. There's going to be the occurrence and the intensity of these extreme events are going to increase. And that is the world we are living in currently, especially in South Asia, of course. Bangalore and even neighboring city of Chennai, I mean, these regular cycles of water scarcity and floods have been going on for a very long time. And not all of it is climate change fueled. Of course, a big part of it is uh, there, but there are other just bad urbanization that has led to these situations. From the research, what both globally and now increasingly in India, there is a body of work that talks about decision making under deep uncertainty. So the idea that this constant drumbeat of these extreme events are going to increase and there's often going to be some uncertainty around them. There's suddenly a certain kind of weather phenomenon which might not lead to the you know, extreme rains and floods. And so you have to build flexibility in your governance system, your planning systems to be able to deal with that. And that is why I feel this way we are moving towards where we have desire or hazard specific plans. So you have a flood resilience plan and a heat action plan is sort of dividing us up and not thinking about just building resilience in the system. No matter what kind of hazard comes, you sort of have uh, standard operating procedures, but you have a system of what are the steps you need to take, what are the decisions you need to take, given this kind of uh, hazard profile. Now, in theory, it's nice to talk about these things. I also understand and interact a lot with both city, but also subnational and national government officials. And these are often deeply committed people who are very interested in reducing risk, but are also dealing with a hundred other things. So I think this, we keep on talking about even internationally and domestically about the lack of climate finance or inadequate fi climate finance, but there's a bigger story about inadequate human capacity to deal with risk and complex risk. And that's another space that needs a lot of attention. So in the research, we talk about building out adaptation pathways to multiple hazards where you sort of know step one I do this step two I do this if this doesn't go then I move to another pathway which makes me do xyz so far in India we don't have any system of building out these pathways and of course they have to be based in certain areas in certain geographies they're very location specific but I imagine that's really next steps for India, but also other countries to move towards building these adaptation pathways and then capacities to sort of navigate them. Right. Chani, finally, I'm going to ask you for three recommendations. This can be a book or a movie or a podcast, uh, something that our listeners can uh, pick up to understand a little more about this issue of heat waves, climate change, adaptation. What would you recommend? Okay, this is my favorite part. I guess a book I'm currently reading, I'm not, they, these books and things I'm suggesting are not particular to heat, but they talk about climate change in general, and I think they're useful for lay people to read. So a recent book that I finished, which is which was actually, I think, written in 2010 or 2012, is Flight Behavior by Barbara King Solver. She is an exceptionally gifted writer and also very smartly talks about climate change in a way that it's not the main character. It's always there in the background, environmental change and climate change. But by the end of it, you construct such a beautiful story about how human beings and the local environment intersect. And this story, of course, is about migration of monarch butterflies 
and how that has gone haywire because of climate change. Another book I am currently reading actually is by uh, Arti Kumar Rao called Margin Lands. It's a beautiful book, again, talking about various um, landscapes across India and how they're really changing. Climate change, again, is not is not really central. And she talks beautifully about human systems that have lived in and changed landscapes across the country. It's a beautiful, very poetically written book. And then finally, I guess I am a big fan of, uh, of science fiction. I read a lot of science fiction because I really enjoy it because it sort of gives us visions, possible futures that we can imagine. And I'm currently watching Three Body Problem, which is a science fiction show on Netflix. And what I like about it is, again, you can sort of envision different futures. And I feel that is really important, even in this current moment, moment because sometimes when we think about solutions, there's a crisis of imagination and storytelling and fiction offer us some of the best, you know, imaginations that we can look to. Thank you for those fabulous recommendations. And thank you, Chandni, for joining us on this podcast today. Thank you so much. That was Chandni Singh speaking to Himal South Asian for the State of South Asia podcast. This episode was edited by Ritika Chauhan. You can find many more stories on politics and culture across South Asia on our website, himalmag.com. Don't forget to catch up with our special series on the election in India called Modi's India from the Edges, where we bring you perspectives from across South Asia on what the last 10 years of Modi's BJP in power has meant for the region and what a possible third consecutive Modi term might mean. You can also read reportage and analysis from across the region, listen to our other podcasts and sign up for our newsletters to keep up with Himal's work. We'll be back in four weeks with another in-depth conversation on the next episode of State of South Asia. Thank you for listening and see you then.